Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, what's up? I heard that. Where do you put your trust? Where do you put your trust? This idea of where do you put your trust, right now some of you are thinking, well, Mike, we're sitting in a church service. The obvious answer that every kid from three years old all the way through adulthood knows is Jesus, right? Because those are the two answers you learn when you're a kid in Sunday school. The two answers that usually solve the, whatever question the teacher's asking are Jesus or the Bible. By the way, those usually work for me as well, so just to be clear. But this, this thing of going, well, of course we're in church. We would say we put our trust in Jesus or put our trust in God. But I would say that for many of us, we would say in our heads, that's where we want to put our trust. But when the rubber meets the road and life gets difficult, sometimes that's not always the first place we go. I'll give you a uh, really quick example from my own life from yesterday. My son Joshua plays competitive soccer, and he took a pretty hard foul yesterday, and, uh, and he went down, and like any good dad, I yelled at the ref, because that's what we do right at that moment. Just kidding, I did not yell at the ref. Only because I sit 50 yards away from the field so nobody can hear me. That way I don't have to worry about those things. But he takes a hard fall, and at first Christy was like, maybe he just was like drawing a foul there, because Joshua's known for selling a foul. I don't know if you've watched European soccer, he's learned from some of the best. He can make it look like he got fouled so bad that the world should end right there. He's really good at it. And I said, no, no, I think that kid actually did foul him. I think he got him pretty good. And, and Joshua pops up, and he's, at first he's like a little slow getting up, and then he's kind of moving around, and he's holding his hand. And we're like, well, he got elbowed in the chest. I don't know why the hands hurt him, but apparently he landed on his wrist wrong. So we go check on him, and of course, um, he's like, well, it only hurts when I do this, but not when I do this. Or I, and he's trying to convince me that he's still okay to play video games no matter what's going on with his wrist. That's what he's, I, I realized really quickly that's what he's trying to sell. Um, and, then, and then after the, the game, Christy and I are like, what do we do? And we agree we should take him and have x-rays done. So we run up the doctor. You know what I did not do yesterday? In any one of those moments, I did not stop and go, we should pray for our son right now. So I am here to confess that when I ask this question, where do you put your trust? By the way, he does have a fractured wrist, and so he's going to have to have something looked at this week. And if he wanders around with a cast and he bumps into you, please understand that's what's going on. But going back to this question, where do we put our trust? I will confess to you, as your pastor, I had this moment yesterday where I didn't stop and make the first thing I did, pray. I started managing. He needs an ice pack, right? Should should we take him and go to He's probably fine, right? Like any good dad, we're like, ah, it's a sports injury. He's fine, right? It takes, you have to know the swelling. Start. He has to start swelling before you start worrying about it, right? So let's, let's wait. Thankfully, his mom was smarter than I am. She went straight to the the urgent care and had an x-ray done. But I didn't stop and pray. So we sometimes see these questions and we think, well, that seems like an obvious answer. But in that moment where now I'm trying, we're trying to manage the moment and manage the crisis, I have to confess my first answer wasn't God. So where do you put your trust in those kinds of moments? If I've not had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Mike. My wife, Christy, and I are the co-lead pastors, and we are honored to worship with you today. Where do you put your trust? I remember many, many years ago in a corporate experience, somebody doing the trust exercise. I failed the trust exercise. You know, that's the one where you fall back and you let people catch you. Uh, I was a little bit heavier than I am now, and I'm kind of a big guy now still, but I was probably a good 50 pounds heavier than I am now. And I remember looking back and going, those sweet little girls are never going to catch this dude, right? No way. I do not trust them to catch me. So I didn't do the trust exercise. I failed. And, uh, and, and I know that I have some places where I have really had to work hard on trusting and allowing, knowing that God is ultimately in charge of all things, not me. But this desire to control things around us can sometimes lead to a place where we don't put our trust in God. Maybe we put our trust in our own abilities, our own intelligence, our own ability to, to connect with other people and convince them of something. Maybe there's lots of different ways in which we put our trust. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a psalm of David. It's Psalm 52, 
And we're going to look at the corresponding story that goes along with it out of 1 Samuel 21 and 22. There's a lot of scripture here. I just need to be honest with you. When we do 1 Samuel text, we're just going to go fast. We're, the story speaks for itself. I'm not going to do a ton of explaining in context and things that are going on. We're going to try to run through the story pretty quick. Because we want you to understand that this is one of these psalms that we get a clear picture from, da- from David, what event he's writing about. And we get to go back and look at the event and even understand maybe some of what David's feeling. But you can see in this psalm how David starts the psalm by saying he's laying out what he wants. And then he moves into trusting God as, as the psalm goes on. So what I love about this psalm is that it shows the humanity and it shows that God responds to us exactly in all the things we feel and all those moments where we wrestle and struggle. So let's pray and we'll dive in real quick. We're going to go to Psalm 52. So Jesus, thank you even more for this time today. Thank you for, um, for your work on the cross. Thank you for the, not just the things you did to pay for our sins, but the way that you lived that helped us to see the full humanity in which we can live. I thank you, Father God, that you are not surprised by our emotions. You're not surprised by our feelings or the realities of things we wrestle with. So I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, you would come and speak to each and every person that can hear my voice, those online, those in the room. Speak what you want to speak to each person, regardless of what I say. Come even more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 52 starts off. Uh, there's a little, little part in parentheses above that I don't have on screen for you, but the rest of it I'll have on screen. The, the psalm starts off by says, The psalm of David regarding the time that Doeg the Edomite said to Saul, David has gone to see Ahimelech. All right, let's pause real quick. I just need to be very clear. There's lots of names in this text and in these scriptures that I can't quite pronounce, and I did not practice them. And so we're just going to say this dude and that dude and the priest, okay? So you'll know when we get there. Ahimelech is the priest, and I was really struggling last night to pronounce his name. I think I've gotten better. But all right, so let's go to Psalm 52. Why do you boast? This is David writing. Why do you boast about your crimes, great warrior? Don't you realize God's justice continues forever? All day long, you plot destruction. Your tongue cuts like a sharp razor. You are an expert at telling lies. David is not holding back. You love evil more than good and lies more than truth. You love to destroy others with your words, you liar. This is intense, isn't it? Intense. But I don't know about you, I grew up in a household where my mom said, you don't call people names, you can say they're behaving in certain ways, but you don't call them names. I don't know anybody else grew up in that kind of household. So my, my therapist mom would be really upset that David is like, Assigning attention to his actions and calling him names and whatever. But David's going all out. He's letting it all out. Verse 5. But God will strike you down once and for all. He will pull you from your home and uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see it and be amazed. They will laugh and say, look what happens to mighty warriors who do not trust in God. They trust their wealth instead and they grow more and more bold in their wickedness. But I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. I will praise you forever, O God, for what you have done. I will trust in your good name in the presence of your faithful people. Now, before we head into the story behind this, I want you to see a couple things real quick. There's David's David's obviously sharing from a place of incredible pain and frustration and, and betrayal in this moment. Because he's using language... Uh, that like it's the kind of language I sometimes use with my wife, and she says, you can never say that out loud in front of other people, right? The woman who loves me most looks at me and goes, I understand your frustration. I'm not even saying you don't have a right to feel that way, but you can never say those things out loud to other people so other people can hear you. Uh, he, so like, because he's going right at him, and he spends most of this psalm talking about, he's talking to Doag, and he's seen all these things about him and how God's going to strike him down and people are going to laugh. So he's basically saying people are going to mock you, bro, when you die and the Lord strikes you down. I mean, all these things are bad. 
And, and, and then at eight, when, even when he moves to, but I am like an olive tree, he's sharing what, what he's like. And it's only in verse nine where he actually starts addressing God rather than Doag. Do you see that transition as the psalm works through? So uh, we'll look at the psalm a little bit more, but I want you to, I want to go back and let's look at the story to understand what's going on here. Because he definitely does not like this guy, Doag. And let's explain a little bit of the story and what's happening in this moment. So you guys have heard the story of David and Goliath, right? Little 16, 15-year-old David defends you know, against Goliath, who is uh, as tall as, I don't know, probably built like Shaq, right? I mean, somebody who's a huge, massive man. And David takes him down. The whole army's scared. David, David wins a great battle, and the Philistines are overrun, and God's people are saved. Saul and all of his army and all of his generals are, are, are so afraid. So David is now in this season where everything is going his way. People love him. Saul loves him. Saul actually gives David his daughter in marriage. Uh, Saul's son Jonathan becomes David's best friend. David's hanging out in the royal courts. He plays the harp in such a way that he actually helps soothe Saul's spirit when Saul's troubled. Like David's got it made. Everything is going David's way. People are singing his praises. He's the youngest general ever. I mean, he is, he's the guy. As my son Joshua would say, he is, he is him. He is him. I don't know that I fully understand what that means, but that's what all the cool kids say. He is him. All right. And so then uh, uh, Saul starts to become afraid of David and jealous because in this season, Samuel also anoints David with oil and says, you will be the next king. Saul finds out about this stuff. He starts seeing conspiracy. He starts worrying about what's happening. He starts recognizing that I am no longer going to be king. And so he becomes afraid of David, and he actually tries to kill him a couple different times. Jonathan saves David one time. He actually sends David out of the royal palace, so to speak, and says, go hide out here, and I'll come tell you if I think my father's doing okay, if he's settled down. And he comes out and basically says, hey, you need to run. Like, my dad has lost his mind. You need to run. So David's on the run when we enter into this story in 1 Samuel 21, verse 1. This is the first time that he's no longer, not everything's going his way. Things are going bad. So verse 1, David went to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he saw him. Why are you alone, he asked. Why is no one with you? It would have been normal for David to travel with a group of people. He's a general within the army. He's also head of the king's bodyguard. The king has sent me on a private matter, David said. He told me not to tell anyone why I'm here. Lie. I have told my men where to meet me later. Another lie. Now what is there to eat? Give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. Verse 4, the, the priest replied, We do not have any regular bread. There is only holy bread, which you can have if your young men have not slept with any women recently. It's a lot more of a sermon right there. We're just going to move on. Verse 5. Don't worry, David replied, I never allow my men to be with women when we are on campaign, and since they have stayed clean even on ordinary trips, how much more on this one? Probably another lie. Verse 6, there was, since there was no food available, the priest gave him holy bread, the bread of the presence that was placed before the Lord in the tabernacle that had just been replaced that day with fresh bread. All right, let's pause real quick and let me explain what's happening here. So at this moment, uh, David comes in, he's, he shares a bunch of things that are, that are at best case, even in the most positive light, are misleading. He's trying to not pull Ahimelech into the whole deal. He doesn't know, for all he knows, he and Saul are going to work things out in the next week. He's just really hungry and he needs some help. So he shows up and, and he asks for bread and he ends up lying about, he, he doesn't have any men with him, he's by himself. He doesn't even know... And, uh, there are other cases where we're not sure that he actually made his men be pure and holy on campaign. I don't know. But the point is, is that he's not being truly honest in this moment. Now, in this moment, though, remember, David is on the run for the first time in his life. His life is threatened. He's freaked out. He's scared. And so he, in this moment, he is not putting his trust in God first. He's putting his trust in his ability to work his way out of a situation. He thinks, I'll just, I'll sell this guy a little bit. I'm, I kind of care. You know, there's no way this guy knows that Saul and I are their outs. There's no social media in that day, right? There's no, there's no CNN. There's not even local news. There's no newspapers even, right? 
There's no way this guy knows that Saul and I are on the outs. And so I'm going to use this to my advantage, this space of time, and get, and get some help. And in the consecrated bread, what this means is literally they would take fresh bread and put it in front of the tabernacle every day. And then the next day, they would take that day-old bread and put new fresh bread in. And the priest and his family would eat the day-old bread. That was part of being a priest as you ate the consecrated bread. And you may find yourself going, man, day-old bread, yes. You know that when, if you are not true celiac, okay? So let me, if you're true celiac, ignore what I'm about to say. But if you just have a gluten insensitivity like I do, and you go to Europe where they make fresh bread every day, it does not affect you the same way. I know this because I put on 12 pounds while walking seven miles a day in two weeks in Europe last fall. Because the pano chocolate, who has made every day, which basically means bread with chocolate in the middle of it, so good, and it was fresh. Oh, maybe I should find some place that does fresh break bread here. So good. All right, no preservatives. All right, so that's what the bread is, and it's been replaced that day with fresh bread. So verse 7, now Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief herdsman, which means he ran all Saul's sheep and cattle and all, what, all the livestock he had, was there that day, having been detained before the Lord. Eight, verse 8, David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear or a sword? The king's business was so urgent, I didn't even have time to grab a weapon. It's a partial lie. I mean, the king's business was urgent. He was trying to kill David, and David was like, urgently, I need to get out of here, and he didn't have a weapon. That's partly true. I see how you can make that true. Uh, verse 9, I only have the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, the priest replied. It is wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. Please take it if you want, for there is nothing else here. There is nothing like it. David replied, give it to me. All right, all, all that story, the two things to know are, one, David is panicked, he's on the run, he's never been on the run before, and he's freaking out. And he goes to this priest for help, uh, the priest gives him holy bread, and, and gives him the sword of Goliath, and, and David really uses this to kind of twist and turn things so that he makes sure he gets what he wants. And then the most, other, most important thing is the one line where it says, Doeg the Edomite was there. Doesn't even say how much he was listening. Doesn't say how much he was involved. Doesn't say he even said anything. Doesn't even say like David walked in and went, what's up, bro? I mean, I don't, we don't know how those things went, but he's there. And scripture makes it very clear. All right, so let's move on. Let's, we're going to jump ahead to 1 Samuel 22. David leaves. He has another series of things that happen with this other king. He acts crazy. It's a weird story. You're welcome to go read it if you want to. He's continuing to try to figure out how to get get figure out how to live until things start to get better. It's clear his trust is not in the Lord at this point as well. And then we go to 1 Samuel 22, starting in verse 6. At this point, David has returned to Judah, and here we hit verse 6. The news of his arrival, David's arrival in Judah, soon reached Saul. At the time, the king was sitting beneath a tamarisk tree in the, on the hill of Gibeah, holding his spear and surrounded by his officers. Listen here, you men of Benjamin, Saul shouted to his officers when he heard the news. Has that son of Jesse promised every one of you fields and vineyards? Has he promised to make you all generals and captains in his army? Is that why you have conspired against me? For not one of you has told me when my own son made a solemn pact with the son of Jesse, you're not even sorry for me. Think of it, my own son encouraging him to kill me as he is trying to do this very day. All right, let's pause real quick before we head to the next. This moment, Saul is freaking out. He has lost his mind. He is super jealous of David. He's tried to kill him. Now he finds out David has returned, and he's even more angry, and he sees conspiracy behind every bush and every tree, and everybody's turned against him. He's even, blamed, he's even accusing his own soldiers of conspiring against him. He's accusing his own soldiers of not telling him that that his son and David were best friends that everybody in the kingdom knew, even Saul. Like, he's just, you know how this happens for people when they start to unravel. They start blaming everybody and everything for all of it. And he is, like, losing his mind. All right, verse 9. Then Doeg, here he is, he's back. The Edomite, who was standing there with, Paul, with Saul's men, spoke up. When I was at Nob, I saw the son of Jesse talking to the priest, Ahimelech, Son of, I don't know, bathtub. Ahimelech consulted the Lord for him, 
Then he gave him food and the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. I love that they're not even using David's name. They're calling him son of Jesse. This is what we do when we really turn against people. We no longer actually call them by their names. We actually refer to them as something else. When we depersonalize people, we lose perspective to even see them. You see that? And Doeg there stands up and goes, hey, here's my moment to stand in the sun a little bit. To have Saul the king appreciate me and love me. All right? Verse 11, King Saul immediately sent for Ahimelech and all his family who served as priest at Nob. When they arrived, Saul shouted at him, listen to me, you son of Hatab, Atab, Ayatab. See, he won't even use his name, Ahimelech. He's depersonalizing this moment too. What is it, my king, Ahimelech asked? Why have you and the son of Jesse, do you see that language? Conspired against me. Why did you give him food and a sword? Why have you consulted God for him? Why have you encouraged him to kill me as he is trying to do this very day? It is turning dark. And Ahimelech has no idea the danger he stepped into in this moment. In his mind, David's still a part of the royal family. In his mind, David is still married to Saul's daughter, which technically he is. In his mind, David and Jonathan are still best buds. In his mind, David is still the general of of, uh, one of Saul's armies and the head of the bodyguards. So he responds from this place of logic and truth that people who are in conspiracy mode cannot hear. Verse 14, But Sir Ahimelech replied, Is anyone among all your servants as faithful as David? Talk about pouring salt on a wound. Your son-in-law. Why is he a captain of your bodyguard and highly honored member of your household? This was certainly not the first time I've consulted God for him. May the king not accuse me of my family in this matter, for I knew nothing at all, at all of any plot against you. Saul goes dark. You will surely die, Hamelech, along with your entire family. And he ordered his bodyguards, kill these priests of the Lord, for they are allies and conspirators with David. Then they knew he was running away from me, but they did not tell me. But Saul's men refused to kill the Lord's priest. Then the king said to Doeg, you do it. So Doeg the Edomite turned on them and killed them all that day. Eighty-five priests still wearing their priestly garments. And then he went to Nob and wiped out the rest of everything that existed. What a painful moment. Incredibly graphic, brutal, bloody. There's nothing you can feel in this moment, but how can this kind of stuff be real? In these moments, when we we see these really difficult places of the Bible and of Scripture where, where we ask ourselves, why is that included? I don't have a full, complete answer, but I will give you my perspective of why I think this stuff's included. I think God, in in all of his infinite wisdom, in all of his infinite glory, is fully aware of the dark stuff that rolls around in our own heads and hearts sometimes. And, And God doesn't leave anything out of the Bible. He doesn't whitewash. He doesn't go back and retell the story. He doesn't make them look better. He goes back and tells the story exactly as it is. And these moments that are shared in the Bible are so important because they help us realize how bad we as humans can be when we go dark, when we allow our own hurt, our own places of insecurity, our own places of of fear and anxiety rise up. And we can turn that towards other people in ways where we depersonalize them and we attack them. And, and no, we, we don't quite face this kind of reality in today's world. It's very rare that we step into moments where we go, I'm really going to die right now. But there are places in lots of third world countries and even some second world countries where this is reality. That what you say can get you killed. And so it's such a dark, dark story. And I appreciate that the Bible does not run from these moments because it's important for us to know 
that even in our darkest places, even in the most depraved moments, even in the places where we have wished such ill on others, that ultimately God is not judging us by that moment. He's really looking for opportunities to write a redemption story on our lives. And even the darkest places of our own souls, he continues to invite us to step into redemption. Saul had chance after chance after chance to step into places of redemption. And Samuel over and over and over again tried to draw him into those places because he wanted to see Saul make it. And even after he tells Saul very clearly, you'll no longer be king, he pleads with him to turn to God, to Yahweh. There is a constant invitation for us that even, like, because we can read this and go, yeah, I don't, I am, I will never be a Saul. Probably not. Definitely not in action or deed, but probably not even in your own heart and soul. But, but we can go to some pretty dark places in our own minds if, we, if we're honest. And these kinds of opportunities where we get a chance to go, how do we participate with God's redemption story in our lives and not stay stuck in these patterns where we just spiral down more and more and more? All right, so that's enough about Saul because this really, the story is about David and how he responds out of this psalm. So let's, let's finish that part of the story. So verse 20 of Samuel 22. Only Abiathar, one of the sons of Ahimelech, was escaped and fled to David. When he told David that Saul had killed the priest of the Lord, David exclaimed, I knew it. When I saw Doeg, the Edomite, there that day, I knew he was sure to tell Saul. Now I have caused the death of all of your father's family. Stay here with me and don't be afraid. I will protect you with my own life for the same person who wants, who wants to kill, for the same person who wants to kill us both. So David takes in Abathar, Abiathar, rather, and, and he commits to protecting the rest of his life. But I, what I love in this moment is that he owns his part in this story. Had I not pulled a Himelech into this, this wouldn't have happened. Now, in David's defense, nobody could have evaluated that Saul was going to take a simple moment like this and turn it into a bloodbath. Nobody could see that. But David is owning his part, and he doesn't run from this. And by the way, when Scripture talks about David as a man after God's own heart, it's for things like this. He never passes the buck and blames other people for his stuff. The most compelling moment of David's life is after he has killed his best friend Uriah after taking Uriah's wife. And Nathan shows up and tells him a story of injustice. And he realizes that Nathan's talking about him. And he does not kill Nathan in that moment, although I'm sure Nathan is thinking about Ahimelech in that moment. But he actually totally owns it all completely. Because there is a piece here that's really important for us. This is the difference between Saul and David. Is that David makes lots of mistakes throughout his time as a leader. David makes lots of mistakes in this story. But when things go wrong, he never once blames others. He always owns his part. Always. Do you see this? Now I want to tell you that I think he wrote the psalm in between the killings of Ahimelech and all his family, and this moment with Abiathar. Matter of fact, I think his, his coming to realization and, and owning his own sin came later because I think the psalm speaks of him processing and working that out. So let's go back to Psalm 52. We're going to read it through, and then I'm going to go through my favorite thing I like to do with a psalm and look at the chiastic structure because I just like saying the word chiastic. All right, verse 50, Psalm 52, verse 1. Now, this is David now. Now that you know the whole story, this is David talking to Doeg until verse 9. David says, why do you boast of your crimes, great warrior? Don't you realize God's justice continues forever? All day long, you plot destruction. Your tongue cuts like a sharp razor. You're an expert at telling lies. 
You love evil more than good and lies more than truth. You love to destroy others with your words, you liar. But God will strike you down once and for all. He will pull you from your home and uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see it and be amazed. They will laugh and say, look what happens to mighty warriors who do not trust in God. They trust their wealth instead and grow more and more bold in their wickedness. But I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. I will praise you forever, O God, for what you have done. I will trust in your good name in the presence of your faithful people. It feels even more different now that you know the full story, doesn't it? Clearly there's other things that the story doesn't tell us. Clearly Doag is running around and bragging about his accomplishments and how he now has the king's favor and, and now how he's the guy and he's replaced David as Saul's number two and all those sorts of things. And, and I, I, think, um, I think even as you read this, this psalm feels really dark. It feels really full of angst and, and anger and, and maybe even levels of hate. And, and there's no forgiveness in this psalm. There's no place where David shares and forgives. But remember, this is the time before Jesus. This is the time before Jesus showed up and started talking about things like, actually, you should forgive those who persecute you. You should forgive those who attack you. You should forgive those who say false things against you in the Sermon on the Mount. And you should love your enemies. And I got to be honest with you, I don't feel a lot of love in this psalm. Yeah, I just feel Old Testament justice, all right? All right, the chiastic structure of Psalm 52, we, we've talked about this before. A chiasm is a repetition of similar ideas in a reverse sequence. So it starts in the beginning of the psalm and the end of the psalm, and then it kind of moves in with parallel thoughts. It moves in with parallel thoughts and gets you to the center point where it points to what's the most important thing in the psalm. What's the author really trying to communicate? So if you look at verse 1, why do you boast of your crimes? And you look at verses 8 and 9, but I am like an olive tree. I would say really just say, but I'm like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. There's this opposite parallel, this back and forth of, of uh, who you are, Doag, and who I am with God. Like I, you're about yourself, I'm about life with God, right? And then you, you could refer to that as alternate securities and true security, uh, whether you're being secure in yourself or secure in others. And then you move into the middle, and the middle two are the destructive tongue and the triumphant tongue. So you've got, in these places, you've got verses two and three. You long to plot destruction. You're a liar. You tell lies. You're a liar. You're li- your tongue's like a razor. You're a liar. You keep saying you're a liar. And, and that's the P- one piece, this, this destructive tongue. And then the righteous tongue, where well, the righteous will see and be amazed. They will laugh. They will speak of what God can do uh, when, when God's in charge. So it pushes you into the middle, which is verse 5, which is the divine action. And let's look at verse 5 again. But God will strike you down once and for all. He will pull you from your home and uproot you from the land of the living. Remember, this is Old Testament justice. Old Testament. He sees this moment where he goes, yeah, God's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. Here's the piece I want you to see out of this that's most important out of this psalm. Maybe the two most important verses in this whole, the two most important words in this whole psalm are in this verse, but God. But God. Amelia would jokingly say, I want to do a book about the big butts of the Bible, right? All the different places where there's these butts of the Bible. And, and that's true. But I do think when you read a psalm, Oftentimes, you'll find the word but or the word for. And they're usually that moment where the psalm turns and the psalmist says, here is all of my frustration. Let me pour out all of my soul, all of my anger, all of my hurt, all of my betrayal. Let me lay it all out there for you, God. And then they have this moment where they turn and they say, but God. It's this recognition that only God brings justice, not David. It's this recognition that God's in charge, not David. It's this moment where David finally realizes, oh, I need to trust God. 
Where do we put our trust? So your answer, going back to the very beginning when we talked about this, where do you put your trust? Your answer is, well, of course I would say God. But sometimes I'm just here to tell you it takes you a while to get there. Sometimes we have to work through all the things of what we feel, all the humanity of who we are, and the places of betrayal and lies. And the real, real most important verse is, he says, but again, in verse 8, but I am like an olive tree. And then he turns and it stops talking about himself and he starts talking about the only one who can do anything about it, and that's God. And he finishes by saying, I will praise. I will praise you forever, O God, for what you have done. I will trust, there's that word, in your good name, in the presence of your faithful people. What a beautiful turn. So where do you put your trust? What do we do with this? Okay, we talked about this, right? In, in today's world, the, the amount of people who actually die for things people say is pretty low, particularly in the United States of America. Let's talk on our cultural context. But here's what I would say is that words carry tremendous pain and hurt and value, good and bad. And what I have discovered, I don't know if you're aware of this phenomenon that's happened in the last four years. There's always been this little behind the scenes whispering where people will whisper to one another, they'll talk about one another in ways that are so bad, they'll accuse one another of really awful stuff. But it's always been kind of whispers. It feels like in the last four years, those whispers are no longer whispers. They're not like out in the open. People are talking everywhere. And I don't know if you, if you spend any time on social media. I had finally, about two years ago, we, we took like a mini sabbatical. And I, I shut, my, I shut my, all my social media off for that month-long period of time. And I, I go into Facebook about once a week just to make sure that I'm not missing something major. But man, it just it like wounds my soul. Some of the stuff people say about other people is so painful. And the way they go after and accuse others of other stuff. I love watching. By the way, Facebook started to realize my algorithm. You know how Facebook's got an algorithm. They're going to tell you, let you see what you want to see. And I'm starting to see everybody's celebrations and uh, all their family stuff. And all the pictures that are popping up now are all the happy stuff or all the good stuff. And I'm like, yes, I think Facebook finally caught on. Because I'll say, hide this. I don't want to see any more of this. Hide this. I don't want to see any more of this. And by the way, I... It's really ramped up right now because there's this little thing happening in about two months. Have you heard of this? It's an election. And people have gone really nuts, right? Really nuts. By the way, both political parties, I don't know either candidate very well, but both political parties are trying to sow fear of what happens if the other party gets elected. That's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to draw you in with winsome talk and lots of love and excitement and hope for the future. They're just saying if that other person wins, the world's going to die. Well, the world's going to die eventually one day anyways. But I'm not saying we should rush it to there. I'm just saying, yeah. But I, like it's become really painful, hasn't it? And, and we read the Psalms and we think, man, this kind, of wor- this kind of stuff around the divisive talk and even the way people talk about one another, it seems, it seems like, well, Mike, that's one Psalm. Is it all over the place? Well, actually, C.S. Lewis says it's shocking how much you see it everywhere. In his book, Connivance, Reflections of the Psalm, he wrote, I think that when I began to read the Psalms, they surprised, these surprised me a little. I had half expected there that in a simpler and more violent age, when more evil was done with the knife, the big stick, and the firebrand, less would be done by talk. But in reality, the psalmist mentioned hardly any kind of evil more often than this one, the way people talk. Which is what most, which the most civilized societies share. He goes on to say it is all over the Psalter. One almost hears the incessant whispering, tattling, lying, scolding, flattering, and circulation of rumors. No historical readjustments are here required. We are in a world where we know, we even detect that in the muttering and wheedling coarse voices, which are familiar, one of them may be too familiar for recognition. That's C.S. Lewis's witty way of saying, one of them may actually be your own. Hey, I can promise you, if you are human, at some point, you have shared and, and engaged in talking about others 
Oftentimes we come back and the Holy Spirit convicts us and we feel and we repent. But it's it's become so common we almost don't even notice we do it anymore. And by the way, just to be really clear, uh, I, I was a part of a prayer group about 25 years ago where, with a group of pastors, and, and the way they would pray for other people is by sharing all the gory details of other people's lives. It was really gross. And I remember walking away from those prayer times going, I feel like slimed every time I'm with you. And I finally brought it up and said, hey, this, this feels like it's dark. This does not feel like the way we should be responding. Not everybody needs to know all the details. We can pray for people and that God would come and meet them without knowing all the stuff. Why do we have to do that? So here's, here's what I would say. I don't know about you, but I have discovered in the last, last four years in particular that, man, people can say whatever they want. And, I, and you may find yourself in a place where you go, yeah, Mike, this is the reality of my work right now. I've got people at work saying these things about me, and, and they're not true, but the more I try to defend it, the worse it gets. Yeah, you can't defend yourself from rumors and lies. And you can't defend yourself, particularly when people say, I heard so-and-so say this about that. And by the way, if you don't think this doesn't work, go watch Veggie Tales, Larry Boy's The Rumor Weed. Like, it is, it is classic 101, what happens when a rumor, and of course, Larry Boy walks outside and he goes, there's a weed in my yard, <laughs> right? Yeah, but it, it's all over the place. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? So first of all, I would say, man, when I ask the question, where do you put your trust I think one of the more real places for us is, where do we put our trust when other people are saying stuff? Where do we put our trust when life starts to fall apart around us? I shared this message last night, and I literally had somebody come up to me right after service and ask me to pray for them because they've been having stuff like this happen for them at their work. This is everyday life. And there's something God's inviting us into to participate in his redemption story for our own lives is to be different. It's to be different. If you are at all feeling any sort of guilt or condemnation right now, I just want you to know that that is not God. That's the enemy trying to make you feel worse. God's invitation is always, please come to me. Put your trust in me. Repent and move on. Let's let this stuff go. But I know that I look at this story of David and I go, in this moment of David's life, where he actually participated in not in lies, he participated in places where he did not tell the truth and actually caused the most poss- damage possible. It cost people their lives. He didn't run from that moment and he owned it. He said, that one is my fault. That's on me. And I think there's an invitation for us. And then I think we're supposed to turn it the other way. Uh, Sky Jatani in his, um, in his daily devotional called With God Daily, just a few months ago on this song, said, just as God spoke the cosmos into existence, he invited, the, he invited man, I think I did a typo here, he invited man or human to participate in the creative work by naming the animals. Our speech can still be used to Build, bond, and bless. Our speech can still be used to build and bond and bless. Oh Lord, let us be a church that speak in ways that build and bond and bless. Part of being a student of Jesus Christ is learning how to use our mouths as God intended for creation rather than destruction. Part of being a student of Jesus Christ is learning how to use our mouths as God intended for creation rather than destruction. I was sitting with one of our team members about three weeks ago and, and we were talking about, um, I'm just going to finish this by sharing a little bit of my personal story and then the worship team will come up. But we were talking about some of the things that have been said about Christy and I over the last four years. And he's like, I don't even know if I should share this with you. He said, I don't even know if you're aware of this. And I go, oh, yeah, I have a top ten list. I have a top ten list of things that people have said about me. And here's what's hard about that is my desire, my desire in my natural flesh 
is to want to go to each person that I know has been shared things and argue and defend and communicate and give my perspective and help people see it. But there's two things I know. One, the moment I engage in that, I give it validity that it shouldn't have. And two, I have to trust God with that stuff. I can't defend myself. You can't defend yourself from things that people aren't bringing to you. And by the way, even when people bring things to you, we shouldn't be defensive. We should ask questions to seek to understand rather than moving into defense mode. And so I just need to, to tell you as your pastor that I have struggled in this very area. And as I was preparing this message, the person who was being the most challenged in this moment was me. And so thank you for letting me work my stuff out in front of you as I've been working on it all week. But I know that God's desire is for us to be a church that build, bond, and bless. I want us to be people who are so for the things of Jesus that that other stuff just falls away. It's like water hitting a rock. It just falls right off and drips away. I do not need to defend myself. You do not need to defend me. You do not need to defend yourself either. We trust God, and we are going to be a people who trust God. This is what it looks like for us to be the family here at Larkspur Church in Larkspur, Colorado. And so my desire for you is that you would find like life in this. You would see God drawing you out of. And what becomes is society just wants to keep sucking us back into this cesspool of mess. And it's really hard to keep say, taking the high ground and go, no, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord. And even in moments where we do what I did yesterday, where you trust the Lord after you take him to the doctor, we're still going to trust the Lord. Even in moments like what David does where he's like, He shouts out all of his hate and violence and anger and then trust the Lord. We're going to trust the Lord. We're going to be people that say we put our trust in God. That's the kind of people we're going to be. Amen? So let's let's talk real quick about a couple maybe avenues. If you're in a place where right now you have People coming up that you go, man, Mike, you don't understand. I don't. I don't understand your personal story. I just don't. And I don't need to, but God does. But who do you need to forgive today? And then I want you to go past just forgiving them. I want you to actually release them to the Lord and bless them. We bless those who persecute us. Because even the pagans love those that are our friends. But Jesus invited us to love our enemies. We bless those who speak of us. We bless those who plot against us. We bless those who, who have really messed with us. Hey, I, I have a history. I've unfortunately had to deal with incredibly difficult post-divorce history of working and navigating through managing kids together. And it wasn't always pretty. And there were lots of moments where I would be sitting in front of my attorney and go, at what moment do I get to stand in front of a judge and say these are lies? And he says, you don't. That's what you have me for. I'm your advocate. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be our advocate, the one who speaks on our behalf in places where we can't. This is what it looks like to release and to bless. And I think for some of us, too, there's another piece where we need to repent of places where we participated with stuff. And we just need to commit in future moments that we just go, yeah, I I don't want to be a part of this conversation. Can we talk about something else? We don't have to call it out. We don't have to call out other people. We don't have to look at them and go, you're sinning right now. I mean, it's not what I'm encouraging you to do. But to be people just go, we're not going to participate in that. This is the Lord's invitation. So Trayvon and worship team, uh, Vianne and Shannon, Taylor, if you guys would come back up. And we're going to close with some worship. So if we all could, could we all stand? So what I just want to lead us through is a time of prayer and real quick. And then 
during our ministry time, we'll have a few people available. If you want somebody to pray with you about this or anything else, uh, sometimes I know that when there's physical healing stuff going on, sometimes we need people to pray for us. Because once we forgive, oftentimes the physical healing can come afterwards. I've seen that happen. As people, sometimes people hold on to unforgiveness and don't realize it's keeping them bound up. So I know our folks will be glad to pray with you. And, and if there's anything else, even just maybe relational stuff, you need some people to pray for you, maybe there's something health-wise going on, our folks will be glad to pray. And then on either side are uh, communion elements. And they are truly all gluten-free. So no matter whether you can eat the gluten or not, you can have the gluten-free ones. So Lord, I just pray right now in this moment that for each and every one of us, again, Holy Spirit, come speak to our hearts, to our souls. Get past even anything I have shared and go straight to the heart of each individual person here, Holy Spirit. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people who forgive well. You would help us to be people who would bless well. And then, Lord, that we would turn our attention to you in praise and worship well. Thank you, Jesus.